Now we jump on to our next conversation this morning. We're looking at a very important, uh, you know, issue that have come up every single time we have this actually come up in our conversations the fact that we need to make sure that collaboratively we are able to empower each other and i'm talking about the african diaspora uh, relationship now we've had too many things happening in the last four years uh, the year of return, the, uh, the beyond the return, you know, people coming home just to experience what is happening home and all of that. But we cannot leave it just like that because we've started a conversation. It's something that we need to periodically make sure that we are, you know, still talking about it for people to get the awareness. And that's the reason why this morning here in the studio, we have this conversation coming up. So the Gavi Nkuma Fellowship Program uh, was established in honor of international civil rights uh, personalities or leaders, political leaders, if you like, uh, theorists uh, and dignitaries as uh, Marcus Gavi and the one and only Kwame Nkuma. And uh, the fellowship provides a comprehensive uh, experiential learning laboratory for program participants as well. Now, over the years of his existence, uh, specifically, fellows actually receive a professional uh, development experience uh, through legal internships and also some uh, capstone projects which has been designed to advance solutions uh, that address targeted legal, socio-economic, and also public policy issues within the following uh, regions, Africa, the Caribbean, and the U.S. of A. Now, how do we marry these two things that I've spoken about, and how do we even get the impacts that we're looking forward to, to help us understand that better? And the studio with me, the one and only, the professor himself is here, John L. Woods, Esquire, and he's the founder, Gavi and Kuma Fellowship Program and uh, Professor Howard University School of Law. That alone should tell you that we're in for a very good conversation, right? Okay, so let me introduce my guest, Prof. Good morning, good to see you. Oh, good morning. You put pressure on me. But oh, we'll, we'll my goodness. It. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> You're the professor here. Absolutely. I'm learning. But it's good to see you once again. Likewise, and thanks for having me. Great any time. How, and how, how's it going, man? Great. Hey. Loving the Accra. Mm -hmm. Always great to visit Ghana. Yeah, but, but we are here on a mission with uh, the fellows, so Correct. it's been some work and, of course, um, experience in the culture. Mm. And it's been how many days, weeks already? Wow, we arrived the twenty-first. Oh, you've been here for a while. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, oh yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about some of the things you've tasted and that, those that you've run away from. Yeah, <laughs> 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 a bit later, but uh, let, let, let's look at that. You know, what will provide us some insights, an overview of this entire program you're here for. So you touched on it. I mean, um, over the last couple of years, there's been this movement of the diaspora, right? And when you look at the common conditions um, concerning black folks globally, not just here in Africa, but in the Caribbean and in the U.S., it appears as if in the past mm. we've tried to address these issues yeah. in silos, right? So unfortunately, it's still socioeconomic indicators demonstrate that Black folks globally still live in the poorest areas and the poorest regions. You look at the least developed countries, 33 of 54 mm. African countries fit into that category, as well as Haiti. When you look at developing countries, almost all of the Caribbean and Africa fit in that category. Mm. And then you look at the U.S., the poorest countries, excuse me, states from Arkansas to Louisiana, Alabama, South Carolina, disproportionately um, African Americans live in those regions. Yeah. So something has to change, and I think we just need to be intentional about addressing these issues. Mm. Let, let's talk about the concept itself, <laughs> the, the two leaders you put together, you know. I mean, obviously, uh, there must be reasons why we got to that point, right? Mm -hmm. But beyond that, what were we looking at in terms of these two personalities? So let's take a step back, right? When you, when you look at countries recently um, that have emerged economically, mm -hmm. China, yeah. Israel, India, all off the backs of their diaspora, yeah. right? But the difference is they're countries, not a continent, yeah. right? So the beauty of Garvey and Nkrumah, they gave us integration models, yeah. one economic, one political, Physical. right? And I think for the diaspora, um, to cultivate, to increase its standards. It has to be a comprehensive, uniform effort with the continent being integrated mm -hmm. and serving as home base mm -hmm. for economic development. Mm -hmm. So that's where the model came from. They left us with a model. And, and the beauty of their model is, let's look at Garvey, 
1920s, 1930s, yeah. through the star line. He, again, he tried. Yeah. He attempted to actually integrate trade within the U.S., Europe, and uh, the Caribbean. And then in Kruma, yeah. he understood the importance. I mean, his vision was a United States of Africa because he realized that it had to be integrated. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is activate these visions mm. by creating young men and women, training them throughout the diaspora to create an infrastructure in regards to skills and assets to, to move these visions forward. Mm. Um, and our team, HBCUs, Caribbean as well as African uh, institutions, representing seven countries and eight institutions. Okay. And there's 15 individuals in the cohort. I see. One key thing that I found is <laughs> the fact that the program put a lot of the emphasis on, on these areas, solidarity, capacity building, collaboration, yes. solutions, application of solutions as well. Now, how, how important are these, you know, in terms of making sure that we're able to achieve the dream we put on ourselves? Well, look, we have to overcome some of our issues, right? And I think the only way to do that is to work collaboratively to recognize that most of our issues are the same, um, that we're, we're dealing from a deficit by not being uniform and collaborative. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of the program, and I stress this, it's not an academic program. Okay. It's actually an apprenticeship. And what we do is we train these students and then we pair them with entrepreneurs, oh. um, companies, most importantly, as well as government agencies, U.S. Congress, Caribbean Union, Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, and although the Africa Continental Trade um, Area Secretariat, we don't have someone placed there, they have consulted with us. And the ob objective is to not only learn by doing, but also to provide capacity for these organizations that are trying to move the diaspora forward. Wow. So over the period, what has been the major challenge in doing this? <laughs> I think you have a time constraint, right? <laughs> This is what I, I guess being from, from the U.S., I didn't really appreciate the difficulty of movement yeah. in regards to black folks globally, from visas uh, and the other obstacles moving from country to country. Yeah. So just taking these, these, ind these individuals and students from around the world and moving them throughout or trying to um, was a challenge. And, but... We, we're committed to it because the genius of both Garvey and Nkrumah, they weren't static. They moved throughout the diaspora, and they understood the cu cultural nuances within the diaspora, and I think that's important for the program. Mm. Beyond that, do political leaders understand the need for this? Because you can begin this from the base. Yep. If the top does not really see the need for this, then we have a problem, because Absolutely. then again, you still have the pushbacks. How, how do you think they understand these concepts? It's amazing, I mean, from Congressman Jeffries in the U.S. to um, the uh, head of the OECS. Once they heard about this concept, they all dived in, wow. lent their time, their expertise. And the beauty, before we sent the students out in the field, they have to go through an intensive um, legal public policy business boot camp. All practitioners, individuals from around the world, lent their time to, to help train them. So... I think we get it, and we have folks in position now to actually do this, but the vision has to be activated, mm. and we have to be intentional about activating it. Mm. Let, let's talk about some of the programs under them, like the benefit that comes with this. You know, mm. you spoke about internships and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beyond that, what else do we, do we in, in, intend to get from this? Oh, SMEs, for example. Okay, right. which is a very serious area as well. <laughs> yeah. we, we have clients, so we call them client partners. So, for example, and I'll highlight two here in, uh, in Ghana, Colorbox, as well as Ford Communication. Okay. Ford Communication is expanding their platform throughout the diaspora. Mm. That's expensive, though, if you're trying to do business here in the, on the continent, in the Caribbean, as well as in the U.S. Yeah. So we provide a legal team for them. Oh. All right? So we had a student from the U.S., two from the U.S., one from the Caribbean, one from Africa, to help build out their legal infrastructure, and the same thing for uh, Colorbox. Um, throughout, the, throughout the continent as well as the UK, so we provide capacity for SMEs to move forward with their visions and their objectives in regards to doing business globally, most importantly throughout the diaspora. Mm. And the African leaders really very, very 
into this. We'll see. <laughs> I mentioned nothing. <laughs> I know where we're coming from <laughs> and how difficult, I mean, it is sometimes to make them understand that this is the way forward. Now, even in principle, they may understand you, but it gets to a point where you still know that, you know what, the understanding is there, but these leaders will give us problems. So here, here's what's interesting. One of the reasons we travel to Ghana, for example, Ex yeah. is um, not only so the students understand the cultural nuances. Again, we're black folks, but we're not monolithic, yeah. right? So they're cultural nuances. But in doing so, we've also met with government leaders throughout. And we've had some very spirited discussions okay. about what would work and what wouldn't. But I will say this, I've, I've been pleasantly surprised at how open um, the leaders have been. Because I think one of the issues we all understand, the reason we're in this perpetual issue economically is because black economies typically are resource economies, mm -hmm. not innovative or productive uh, production economies. So we provide cheap labor, cheap raw materials. Yeah. And that's not just here, that's in the Caribbean, even in the South, in the U.S., right? However, wealth building is through production. So the only way we're going to shift is to be intentional, and that's kind of what this program explores. How do we shift from this place of a resource economy yeah. to more of a production-based, innovative economy? And I think, especially with some of the discoveries here in, in, in Ghana, for example, we're beginning to understand that. Could we imagine, for example, with cocoa, if you could produce it here, yeah. all right? It changes everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, another major issue is the, and, and of course, is the, one of the aspects that your mm -hmm. fellowship actually deals with, and I'm talking about human rights. Yep. You know, um, a few weeks back, we've had some kids trafficked, you know, on Volta Lake and all of that. It became a very big issue because mm -hmm. the BBC put some documentary together that exposed some of these activities by NGOs mm -hmm. here in, in the country. Mm -hmm. um, beyond some of these things, we're saying, how do we provide assistance for people? who are human trafficked in situations like that. Do we have um, students that will come out, you know, and majorly put the focus in the ensuring that some of these things get to stop on the continent? Of, of course, and, uh, and more often than not, again, even these instances, economics play a role, yeah. right? Trafficking is lucrative. Tra trafficking is part of labor. Um, so within the construct of looking at economic solutions, yeah. These are kind of the injuries and byproducts of that. So by addressing increased standards, living, structures, laws, we could begin to also um, create safeguards for victims. And we study and, and explore that as well. Okay. So where do we begin now? We're in Ghana. How do people get to now know that, okay, we're here? This is what we're beginning and all of that. I'm excited about this. Sure. So, in fact, we start our application process for the next cohort in October. And, and the, um, the email, the website is www.afca-us.org. And then you click Garvey and Kruma and you'll see the um, timeline from applications to interview. It is a very intense process. <laughs> Uh, I like that. It's process. very intense process <laughs> because, again, we, we're receiving applications from Africa, the Caribbean, and throughout the U.S. So last year, I'm sure we left uh, some superstars out, oh. but, but hopefully we can capture them this year. Oh, so. that I <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I'm, I'm excited about this. So now one other thing that I want to find out is the fact that we believe, and I mean, over the years, it is believed that major, you know, institutions have made efforts mm -hmm. and then backing on some of these dreams, like we rightly said right from the beginning. Now, um, for us and what we're doing right now, the unique thing about this, so that people don't get to know that, okay, it is the same repetitive thing that yep. we're trying to see again, because there always <laughs> had to be that point where you get to feel that this has a very unique approach to solving the issues. Because at the end of the day, not just beginning the problem, but the issue solutions. Yeah, absolutely. It has to get to a point where we feel that we can really make some impact. So his, his was very interesting. Typically, when I've worked on projects before, especially coming from the U.S., yeah. it's always been a U.S. approach in trying to fit it within the local culture. That's true. So our, our model is, our partner, Gimpa, is our partner here. 
Oh, great. Um, the University of the West Indies is our partner in the Caribbean, and then Howard Law is uh, in the U.S. So we really lean on partnership mm. to make sure we understand cultural nuance, to make sure well, this is not only sustained, but we're really addressing the issues that need to be addressed as opposed to us creating what we need to address. Mm. Uh, and building stronger ties, um, what do you think? It's one of the things that we need to be looking at if we're looking at, you know, tying up the, the, the locals like, you know, it is, and then those in the diaspora, how, how, what's the best approach can we take on this? I always look at um, music. Oh boy. Right? <laughs> yeah. Afro beats, hip hop, dance hall, uh, uh, reggaeton, yeah. right? You just do it. There, you have to figure out the synergy. And that's what we're trying to do by bringing these individuals together from different regions, but most importantly, dispatching them mm. to different regions. Mm. You can't be stagnant, can't sit behind the desk and do this. And that's why I stress this is not an academic program. So you actually have to get out there. And I'll give an example. We look at, again, I keep raising the cocoa issue because I think that's going to be a litmus test as to how this moves forward, yeah. right? So you have Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, they have an initiative, possibly Cameroon, as well as... Um, um, Nigeria, and that's 70% of the world cocoa. Mm. One of our students that work for the OECS, for example, Grenada. Why isn't Grenada part of that? Wow. Right? And this is because we're having these dialogues. You have individuals from different regions. We're beginning to explore issues, mm. not in silos, yeah. but collectively. Yeah. So think about it. Although Grenada's only 3 to 5% of the world's cocoa, you include them within that dynamic. Now it's not only 75%, but you're integrating the diaspora, right? Knowledge sharing, market access, uh, um, resources, mm. etc. So we have to be intentional. We have to identify the opportunities, and it must be synergy so we can create our Afrobeat. <laughs> Interesting. Now, if you just join us here on the show, that's uh, is our prime design segment. And I've got in the studio Professor John L. Woods Esquire, and we're trying to understand what it means like to, you know, consistently uh, uh, bring, bring people together. We're talking about diaspora and the local. And it's, it's been a difficult thing, you know, not until we had a year of return and others coming through and all of that. It has not been an easy road. And for me, when I see that we're trying to make another impact in, yeah. in those areas, I'm very excited about it because when you travel and you hear some of the conversations that go Absolutely. on, many people want to just come back and see what's going over here, how they can even inject into the economy. And it's always been a problem because they don't even know where to start in Absolutely. the first place. Absolutely. You know, so for a fellowship like this, which has two great names, you know, on it, and as much as possible pushing that agenda, that makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. you know. But sustaining it. Um, I don't know what the plan looks like, mm -hmm. and I don't know when you intend to come back here again. Oh, we'll, we'll be back here annually. Uh, we'll be here annually. Mm -hmm. um, and, we, and we sustain it, of course, through fundraising. But yeah. we've, we've um, established, as of yesterday, new partnerships because oh, great. There, there are companies now that look at this and say, hold on, we can actually get some man and woman power to help us begin to expand business and okay. opportunities because not only are we providing students and we call it uh, a diaspora based law and public policy firm run by students mm. um, they're also connected to our partners as well as mentors so it's a incubator of sorts to increase trade business connectivity throughout the diaspora Wow, and 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 that's 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 a difficult or less difficult thing to do. Oh no, it's it's hard as heck. It's very hard because you still have all of these moving parts. But again, I go back to Garvey and Krumah. Yeah, their genius is they touched the diaspora. Yeah. They understood the needs of the diaspora personally. Um, and Krumah studying at an HBCU, so understanding the inner workings, the needs and the plight of the African-American. Most importantly, understanding the importance to integrate the continent of Africa and mixing those synergies. And again, 
Garvey was insane. I mean, yeah. get a ship, let's try it. And that's what we're trying to do. Our ship is activating these young men and women within the diaspora to create this infrastructure, whether it's law, public policy, business, to begin to think and be intentional on creating these synergies, creating these pipelines, and sustaining it. And I, and I preach to the, to the fellows, your relationship does not end at the end of this fellowship. It should yeah. just be just beginning. So that's the goal and that's the objective. Mm. So in appreciation, let's look at what the impact on the youth looks like, mm -hmm. you know, because, I mean, doing this, the interaction with the youth will be a lot. There's so much that you would receive, you know, that you get to know that indeed if the, the, the youth on the African continent are very, you know, appreciative of what is there for them and they can make good use of it as a positive yes. or it's something that we need a lot of work done. So when you look at the experiential learning model, in fact, we have several fellows from the continent here. And just the opportunity for a young woman from Ghana to work for Colorbox yeah. and to work behind the scenes to see how this actually looks from a legal or business perspective, yeah. as opposed to reading a book, or most importantly, just being exposed to a traditional approach to law. They've told me it's life-changing, mm -hmm. right? It's creating different paths, different opportunities, a different vision, a different understanding. In fact, we have a young man from Barbados that's looking to come to Ghana and open up a business. So, I mean, just having them in the space where it's not theory, but it's actual practice, and they get to touch some of these issues, I think is life-changing. It's, mm. it's transforming. The problem has always been about the approach, mm -hmm. which has always been theory. Yep. And so if it's practical, then... It, it means that we're going to get a lot of results at the end of the day. And most important, we're realizing some theory doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I mean, that's, that's very true. Because, and, and this has been a concern, you know, over the period where we, we believe that a lot of things have been done theoretically than practical. Mm -hmm. And it means that you still go and then you come back and you, you're still where you are. For example, if somebody's practicing mm -hmm. law, mm -hmm. you know, he's a fellow and he's practicing law and the person is theory based. Yes. You can distinguish that from the one that has done practical more than the theory. Hey, we remember being in school, an instructor that actually worked in the field. And it's not taking anything uh, against someone that has more of a theory based training but it's impactful for someone to tell you how it was as opposed to how it might be. Um, but one of the things I do want to highlight, mm. th this synergy um, amongst the diaspora, I think has really been activated by the aspirations of the new trade agreement, the okay. AFCFTA. Yeah. And again, it captures Garvey and Nkrumah's vision, just uniformity, integration mm. of one, one Africa, one market. Um, again, there's some things that need to be worked out. But if it works out, and I think it will, mm. this, is, this is home base for the diaspora. I think we can really address these socioeconomic um, issues, not just in Africa, but in the Caribbean and the U.S. And that's why I was excited about putting a program like this together, yeah. now creating the infrastructure and the capacity to actually realize this vision. Do you think that we could have done this way earlier than we have? No. Without the integration, couldn't do it. So, again, I think it's important. Uh, Nkrumah's vision of the United States of Africa, that's what this was all about. Mm -hmm. I think he understood that Africa could not be fragmented if we were going to shift or change our socioeconomic status. Um, now, of course... Liberia wasn't ready for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's understood. <laughs> you know, autonomy is autonomy. Yeah. Um, but, again, I think this, this new trade agreement, the approach, again, is aspirational, but we're moving to make it actual. Um, it captures the best of both worlds. You still have the autonomy, mm -hmm. but a single market, I think the next step should be a single currency. Um, you and think it's achievable? Anything is achievable. Depends on how much time we have. Yeah. Hopefully in my lifetime, I'm not sure. But it's achievable. But I think those are some of the issues. Because mm. right now, we're just fragmented. Mm. And, we're, and again, we're operating in, in silos. Mm. But we have the same issues, the same conditions, wherever you are. So it makes sense to integrate, consolidate, 
and to build off the strengths of the diaspora. Is it the case of the fact that there's not too much understanding mm -hmm. as to why there's the need for one currency? Mm -hmm. Or it's just that people don't even think it's necessary? Right. Well, if, you, if you're looking at integration, right, and you have in one single market, mm -hmm. it makes sense to streamline. Yeah. Right. Various currencies, it slows down business transactions. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I also understand the difficulties to get to that point. Yeah. Um, and if we look at the European Union as an example, there were just certain countries that couldn't adhere to the structures and systems financially to make that work. So I can understand the apprehension because you don't want any casualties through that conversion. But I think when we look at the diaspora, when we look at integration, um, it can streamline the process. Mm -hmm. In terms of disputes, conflicts, mm -hmm. you know, in, in that area, have we done so much, you know, in raising people that, for example, in Ghana here, we have the Attorney General uh -huh. always fighting, you know, with other <laughs> countries on our behalf, which is a good thing because then if we're raising more fellows, fellows like these, then we know that they get into policy making and eventually they get to defend us in various ways. You think that we've raised enough enough when it comes to that? We need to do a better job. And it's not just here in God. I'm sure you have access to, to uh, our shenanigans in the, in the U.S. Mm. But one of the things we stress to the fellow, all conflict is not bad conflict. As okay. long as there's a strategic approach for mutual understanding eventually. Yeah. Advocate for your position, right? But there has to be an outcome. It's, your strategy should not be just to frustrate the process. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we are globally right now. Just frustrating processes without uh, having a meeting of the minds or even an objective. The objective is to frustrate the process. And we have to move beyond that. And that's, and that's something we, uh, that's part of our, our curriculum. Yeah. Is, is having the <laughs> fellows understand that they need to be intentional, even if conflict is a strategy. Yeah. And sometimes it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you, you've, you've experienced all these things? Oh, absolutely. I mean, think about it. We, we all have governments. Mm -hmm. some, some work better than others. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but I remember, I remember years ago yeah. right, when, when governments worked a bit more efficiently or effectively, there was advocacy with the understanding we had to transition from advocacy to negotiations to outcomes. Yeah. Right now it's advocacy and frustration, and that can't be the process. And that's crazy. Mm -hmm. That's it. But it, it still goes down to where they land these things from. Absolutely. And, and Absolutely. that's what the problem is. And, and even, even through the simulated exercises the fellows go through, it's, it was tough yeah. because that was a paradigm shift yeah. for them, right? I'm supposed to be angry just to be you angry. Know, to fight for my own. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm not supposed to be, I'm, I'm not, am I supposed to transition this anger into an actual outcome? You know, so, yeah. and that's a paradigm shift. I don't know where we lost it, but we need to get back to it. We need to get back to it. And if you just join us here on the show, so this is our priming side this morning. And we're speaking about a diaspora. We're speaking about uh, law. We're speaking about everything that, you know, has to do with integrating, you know, the, the various aspects that we have to bring together to ensure we get to a point where we all feel safe at certain places. We all know that, you know, if you go here, you belong there. If you do, if you're doing this, like, like the year of return has always done, you know, many of these people come here, they go back with great stories about the country. And that's what we want to see happening a lot more times, you know. And so it's a good thing to, uh, for us to speak about this. Now, before we get to wrap up, let me, let me find out from your, your mm -hmm. point of view in some of these policies that the African continent has had to leverage sure. on in ensuring that we're able to draw the foreigners sure. or our brothers and sisters, sure. if you like, to us. Is it a good approach by putting shows, events on the calendar to ensure that, okay, in, in, in December, Ghana is the place to go. Gotcha. In October, Nigeria is the place to go. If you want to be in South Africa, it has to be, have we done the approach well? Or it's just that we're just trying to, to push things in spaces? No, I think music and culture is always a great import-export mechanism, right? Because it it's a gravity, brings people to your space. And then when they're here, 
they actually see, touch, feel, meet, develop, right? Now, it's still going to be tough early going for someone from the U.S. to strike a business venture in, in Africa. Just distance, right? But I think the more you have these opportunities through cultural exchange, it just, it just helps build the relationships to eventually cultivate those synergies and those opportunities. So I think it's a good thing. Mm. So when, when, are you, when are you coming back in December? Well, um, there's a negotiation <laughs> year for me to be back in December. Oh, well, there is, actually. <laughs> the negotiation's at home. <laughs> okay, that, that, that looks good. That looks good. It means that we're going to have you more here in Ghana. Oh, absolutely. I, I love Ghana. It's an amazing place. Mm. Any, any opportunity I get to return, I will. Okay, you're not doing more salads and uh, veggies, I think. You're doing more local. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, you have any favorite yet? I haven't oh, tried any. Yeah, you know, I went to a restaurant the okay. other night. I cannot remember the name of the dish. It was amazing, but I had to take a nap and go to the gym afterwards. <laughs> the reason? <Yeah. laughs> Too much load on you. <laughs> anyway, but would I just a big thank you to you for you know. Oh no, thank you this. for having me. Uh, it's an awesome program. I've checked the website mm -hmm. and it's incredible. Thank I mean, you. now I understand why it's an intense process yes. because uh, there are a lot of things that. If you look at what others are doing, this is very different, you know, mm -hmm. from that, uh, you know, and what I've seen others do. So it's something that we want to sustain it. And that's my, my, my issue, you know, because it's always a problem. Sustaining and I, and I appreciate you actually sharing that. That's our, that's our thing. We want to sustain it. Um, there's a lot of moving parts. But so far, we've been blessed with our partners. They're, they're committed to this. They see the vision. They understand the need. And most importantly, the feedback they get from the fellows and yeah. the students. I mean, yeah, we'll if, be around. Great. If there's someone watching right now, a young person watching right now, mm -hmm. and is interested, the person wants to be determined in doing this. What, what are a few things that you want to tell that person, a very young person that wants to be part of this? So this is a program, and this is how it was described to me by someone else that you've never seen before. And and what we mean by that is. We all conceptualize what we want to be and what we want to do, yeah. right? This is your opportunity to touch it now as opposed to later. And most importantly, it's done in the vein or within the structure to benefit the diaspora. Yeah. So you get the best of two worlds. One, you get to touch an area, whether it's law, business, public policy mm -hmm. that you're interested in. Two, you're developing skills while doing it. And most importantly, the mission and objective is to advance the diaspora. So... I don't think there's a program out there yeah. Uh, yeah. that will give you that opportunity. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's very true. And, uh, well, if you're watching right now and uh, you want to be a part of it, now you can go to the website. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the website for you again so that, you can, go, that. You, you can go and then, you know, uh, check and be part of it because it's something that is changing a lot of lives out there. And mm -hmm. so, yes, uh, we're going to be sharing uh, that on our social media page as well. We're streaming on Facebook, so you can also go there. And once you hit... On the website, you're able to register. You go through the processes. You, you read everything about it, and then you know where you're getting into. It's very, very important. And I have to plug this. Yeah, sure. Do Dr. Julius Garvey, uh, the son of Marcus Garvey, Marcus Garvey, guest lectured for us. Oh. Oh, man. Is it? Oh, man. Oh, man. No, we should have a representative from it. <laughs> oh, man. He heard about the program. We were on a panel discussion with the UN, the UNDP, who's doing great work in regards um, um, to, to just diaspora and the development. But we met at a panel discussion. Um, he guest lectured. He changed our, our students' life. Oh. Oh, yeah. That's really huge. Oh, yeah, yeah. So maybe we should start looking for a representative from Nkrumah as well. I'm jealous about this. I, I'm looking for it. Please. Yeah, you yeah, know, we should. No, I'm Please. dead serious. Which, uh, have you been to the pack, the memorial pack yet? Yes. Awesome. Yes, you know, yes, we, no, yes. no, 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 we, we should look at this. Oh, no, Prof, let's, let's you, make You need to have, do this for us. I'm, I'm, let's get a guest lecture. Listen, from, I'm, you guest lecture and bring, <laughs> bring an Nkrumah with you. <laughs> no, that'll be good. It'll be my pleasure. Absolutely. I'll work on that. Absolutely. Great Absolutely. stuff. All right. So please do want to go on the website, <laughs> afcaus.org. Uh, we'll pull the entire, you know, um, um, link. So you can also, you know, follow that on our social media page. Once you go there, just click on the link and you're able to get to the website. I'm looking at it right now. And so, if you're at an African yeah. institution, you're eligible for the program. Oh, is it? That's it. Yeah. 
Okay, so now I'm thinking. <laughs> Maybe I should apply myself. <laughs> but it's all good. Prof, thanks a lot. Oh, thanks for having me. Making time for us. And uh, we yeah. hope that you do enjoy the rest of your stay here. Oh, absolutely. Well. And hopefully we'll get to see you again. All right. So please, uh, mm -hmm. once again, make sure you go check it out. And that's Professor John L. Woods Esquire. Uh, he's the founder of Gavi and Kuma Fellowship Program, which is doing amazing and incredible works out there. You need to check them out. He's also the professor at Howard University School of Law, and uh, it's a blessing to have him here in the studio this morning to share all of these with us. And I always say you could have been very selfish with this, but you decided to come. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. I appreciate we the appreciate opportunity for this. Absolutely. Great stuff.